Hey, kids. <laughs> Come join the party. I will do that. I'm also hitting the chat. Okay. Thank you, love bug. Appreciate it. Um, all right. It sounds like we have. Oh, Rubnet is here and Kirstiana is here, are here on the live stream. Hello, welcome. Thank you for being with us. And hello, everybody. I am Kat Udero, psychic empath and psychic wrangler. And before we see who I have wrangled in today's show, I want to welcome you to Third Eye Salon, where in each and every show, we take a fresh look and a deep look between the veils of reality. And today is no different. We are looking between the veils of the matrix that's in surrounding us right now. That's uh, everyday life for us, whether we realize it or not, with researcher, author, and world traveler, Brad Olson. So we're so grateful to have him here. But before we say hello to Brad, ooh, I'm going to switch my screen into the Brady Bunch view so they can see all of us. Um, so before we say hello to Brad, let's say hello to Linda Coulter Burge, psychic conscious business coach, my bestie. Linda, how are you? I'm doing wonderful today. And hello, everybody. Our recording just stopped, but that's okay. <laughs> I will be your live chat host. And so as always, my policy is be nice or get out because I don't have a tolerance for people who aren't tolerant. Also, please like, share, and subscribe so that we can share everything that we are doing with the world and bringing more people to our guests so that they can share their mission. If you aren't able to catch us on YouTube, you can always pick us up on Apple and Spotify. And for those of you who are able to donate to Third Eye Salon and buy us a coffee, thank you. We really, really, really appreciate everyone, whether you can or not. But we do appreciate when you buy us a cup of coffee. Um, and also join our Facebook group. If you haven't been on there yet, we have great discussions and would love to see you. And with that, hello, Brad. I'm excited to have you as our guest this week. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me on the Third Eye Salon. I'm going to try to activate my third eye and get caught up with you guys. Maybe we can <laughs> just do this whole interview telepathically. <laughs> That'd be, but we'll just all be like being, giving each other knowing looks like mm, yeah. mm. the whole interview <laughs> and everybody will understand us. <laughs> you have to be part of the club to, to pick up the, the conversation. <laughs> um, let us also say hello to Jason Atkins. Who's Jason Atkins? Well, he's a psychic medium. He's an artist and he's able to channel and bring to vision your ET family and what I call the fractal family, our, our fractal family, galactic fract fractal family. And hello, Jason, who do you have off to your shoulder today? Who is this? My newest creation, right? Um, so I've been calling them Fatum. So it's a play on words, they, them, because they never expressed gender, right? So they were never like male, female, it was they, them. So they don't, they don't, I think is what I, what I nicknamed them. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, we're happy to have you. Have they told you any information or are they just kind of no, not in your aura? Yeah, it was just somebody that popped in for a couple of days and was like, put me, like, <laughs> draw me like one of those French girls, right? <laughs> <laughs> like one of those French ETs. Yeah. Um, you just can get a little beret and then. <laughs> right. <leave. laughs> a big beret. <laughs> a raspberry beret. Even. A raspberry beret. Um, all right, then. So thank you so much, Jason. We always love having you here. I love your energy. So I'll flip this back into speaker view, and I'm going to read Brad's bio so you all know who he is. If you don't know who he is, you should know who he is. Who he, who he is. Uh, Brad Olson is a captivating speaker and author of 10 books, including three in his esoteric series, Modern Esoteric, Future Esoteric, and the newly released Beyond Esoteric, links below down in our description. An award-winning author, book publisher, and event producer, his keynote presentations and interviews have enlightened audiences at Contact in the Desert, UFO Mega Conference, the 5D events, and dozens of radio, including Coast to Coast, Ground Zero, and the Patriot Underground, and television shows, including Ancient Aliens, on, uh, America on Earth, Beyond Belief, Book of Secrets, The Truth is Out There, and Mysteries of the Outdoors. He has traveled 
to all seven continents, hashtag not jealous, including Antarctica by sailboat, seeking adventure and the answers to the mysteries of the human of humankind's past. Brad is a founder and co-producer of the How Weird Street Fair in the Soma neighborhood of San Francisco, the Chicago's native esoteric uh, the, the Chicago native's esoteric writing continues to reach wide audiences while he continues breaking ground in alternative journalism, public speaking, illustration, and photography. He's got such an extensive background, so we are so excited to have him here. Give mm -hmm. us a thumbs up if you're excited to see Brad and learn more about this matrix and how to be empowered inside of it so we don't have to live inside these limitations. Um, so Brad, welcome aboard. I wanted to ask you real quick before we get into like, um, knowing about more about you is what are the 5d events? It's like in your bio, it says you've been to the 5d events. Now, do I have to teleport to get there? What is that? <laughs> well, using your third eye in the salon would certainly help, but there are a whole, uh, series of conferences that I speak at and they're just named the 5d events, uh, Sedona, LA, Bay Area, mostly Las Vegas, been doing them over the years and good uh, stepping stone to other bigger events. And I have several okay. conferences I'll be speaking at, not only for the a couple more for the end of this year, but uh, already getting booked into 2023. Wow. That's awesome. Well, let's talk about, I kind of want to just get to know you um, on a personal level because you've got, you've written so many books and, um, and they're really great. I started being able to read um, Beyond Esoteric um, online uh, on your, on your, yeah, you speak, you say something so people can say it, otherwise people can't see it. Beyond Esoteric, Escaping Prison Planet. <clears throat> okay. So it was, it's, it's great. I mean, that's a thick book, but it's, so you can read some of it online and there's just so much um, unpacking of the world we live in. And, but I want to know, like, who were you as a kid and how did you decide that this is the path you wanted to follow? I know how you got into travel a little bit from, you know, watching your interviews, but maybe you can take us through like little Brad to like, this is what I'm going to do with my life. That's a great question. I've never been asked that in such a way. Be happy to uh, fill you in. So Please. from the time I was a little kid, I, I recognized that there was something wrong, something keeping us from entering into a utopian like civilization. For example, why is there poverty? Why is there people around the world starving? Why is there environmental degradation? Why is there pollution? Why are we still using gas cars? I was asking these questions from the time I was uh, in grade school even. And I had a, a, a very re revelatory moment one day walking home from school. And I, I didn't know anything at that time, what I was going to do with my life. But I was told that there are big horizons ahead and just hang in there and uh, things are going to work out. I was just a skinny kid in the Midwest, not really knowing much from anything. And so you had a revelatory moment. Yes, I did. Well, don't bury the lead. Tell us about that. Well, I mean, for you guys in the third eye salon, this is right up your alley. I was basically just walking home from school one day and, and basically was under this beautiful willow tree near where I grew. And I'm kind of looking around and light streaming in and <clears throat> felt the presence of what we could describe as our guides. Uh, those etheric beings in the other realms that uh, speak to us. It, it's our intuition, it's our inner knowing, and it is those ancestors perhaps that are following us and helping us make good decisions and perhaps keeping us out of trouble. And so it was a very profound moment when I was told that I would become what was said at the time, a super influencer. And this is not to be egotistical with my books or conferences or interviews I do. It's just, I didn't know it at the time. I had no idea. And I said, well, why? I mean, I'm just an ordinary kid in Arlington Heights, Illinois. And uh, said, well, you'll see. It, you Just bear with us and, and live your life and do what you dream to do. And everything's going to work out. And so, well, that did lead me to traveling around the world. I've always self-financed my own trip. So it's not like I'm getting funding from an external source. I pay for everything on my own. And, and so that was amazing. And that gave me this incredible insight into how the other half 
lives and most of the people of the world <laughs> live on two dollars a day and to see that and to to experience the happiness in some of these very impoverished people but they're multi-generational households where the grandparents live with the kids live with the grandkids and they're all happy and inviting you in for tea and they really have so little yet they're very generous that really made a big impact on me to just see that uh happiness and contentment is something that comes from within mm -hmm. and so i've always been on that path myself and that name santosh is a name i got in india a sannyasin name and that's what it means happiness and contentment so i think there are no coincidences in the world and this has led me into uh, book publishing i was a travel writer for about 15 years until uh, around the time of the internet things started really going down in the travel field because why would you buy a travel guidebook if you could get all your information for free on the internet? So that's when I pivoted over to these esoteric subjects, which is what I've been interested in my entire life. Just trying to understand the wheel work of the universe and why things are not a utopia planet here. In fact, mm -hmm. it's more of the construct of a prison planet. And so this has led me on this path to try to deconstruct it all, figure it out for myself, really. But because I'm a good storyteller and some say a, a good writer to put it into this book form and then offer it to you guys as what it is that's going on in this planet and how we can escape from it. Well, we're absolutely going to talk about, I really want to get into the matrix and um, what you see about it. And because I mean, that's what your books are really about, are kind of identifying it. Yep. Um, before we get into that, though, I want to see if, if Mr. Jason or Miss Linda have any questions they want to start with before I dive in. And if not, that's okay, too. But I just want to give yeah, people a good. You're both good. Okay, great. Um, so let's kind of just unpack a little bit about what you see about the matrix, because I think that there's, I think being able to define our terms is huge because otherwise people can trot along and think you're talking about the same thing and, and you're really not. So we've got the physical world, the matrix of the physical world. And, and, and from what I understand, the word matrix actually, like the, the root word also means mother. So there's something about like the matrix of life that's holding us, that's nurturing us, you know, our, our genetic matrix. So you can talk about the matrix of a tree. And so there's just like this life force that we are all connected to that's holding our vibrancy. And then there's a matrix which has been imposed. Uh, what's your definition of the matrix? That's how I see it. What's your what's your definition, Brad? Sure. Well, a common reference would be, of course, the movie The Matrix, where Neo was offered two paths: the red pill, uh, which is show you how deep the rabbit hole goes, or the blue pill, remember nothing, wake up in the morning, go back to your cubicle, and go to work. So I think a lot of us identify with the red pill path, and that is unpacking all this that has been hidden from us. In fact, that is what the nature of the word esoteric means, is information and knowledge that's only available to a select few. And once everybody starts to understand those subjects, the word actually changes to exoteric. Not quite as fun and sexy anymore, but uh, <laughs> that is the path we want to go to. In fact, I'm routinely surprised how many subjects that are right in all three of the esoteric series of books have start to come true, or at least known by the mass amount of people. And that's a good thing. That is what we want. That is the great awakening. So the matrix is a reference to the movie, but it is also these construct, this false matrix construct of our mind. And just keep that in mind because it is a beautiful planet out there. I'm not saying that this gem, this garden planet, is a prison. The construct has been built around our mind to keep us believing in this false narrative that has led us down the wrong path. So in this process of the Great Awakening, we're seeing people at their own pace, but waking up to all the deceptions and all the falsehoods of the world. And in their own mind, it's a ding, 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 light bulb moment. And that's when they move over to our side of the ledger. And that's what we really need because the revolution is consciousness. 
We're not going to mm-hmm. fight them eye for eye, tooth for tooth. We'll get slaughtered. They got all the weapons anyways. And we're people of well, non-violence anyways. And that's what it's, I mean, if you fight physical with physical, then you're just playing at that same, you know, it's like exactly. throwing sand in the face of the kid who threw sand at you. It's like, it's, it's tit for tat. It's not, it's not, there's nothing new about that. Is, is exoteric having to do with exopolitics or exo like being ETs? So exo just means on the outside. On the outside. So oh, like exoskeleton or. Okay. Correct. Correct. So exopolitics is all the politics relating to our visitors and how they would then interact sort of like uh, Jason I like that painting behind you <laughs> the gray you. alien there you know he's thinking about things too and, uh, <laughs> big head how can you not so, it was, <laughs> so exo uh exoteric yeah is when these subjects reach the outside the the mass audience okay so we had a our guest, our guest last week was Elizabeth Angland who's just so fascinating and uh, she had like, um, she sort of, I don't want to say she bypassed the Kundalini Awakening, but she had an, um, cause she's been connected to ETs and she was like three um, for better and worse. And, but she had a, she woke up one day from a, from being with, you know, hanging out with whoever she was hanging out with. And, and a lot of people, when they have a Kundalini Awakening, then they start to be able to, you know, all of the abilities, our natural abilities kick in. It's like, it's like the circuitry wakes up and our natural abilities that have been limited from us kick in. And so she was able to actually see the physical matrix of the, or the, I should say the energetic matrix that is um, responsive to consciousness and seeks to oppress. And she would see that if someone was starting to wake up, the matrix would like gather around that person in an attempt to keep them like asleep. And so it was fascinating to hear this, like that there's an energetic matrix. It's not just like, um, propaganda there's like an energetic grid that's connected to all of it and so i'm wondering if you would break down for us what your eye-opening moments were like when you started to because you were okay as a kid you were like okay this is why is the world this way it shouldn't be this way you had that understanding coming in and then what were some of the things that you saw that you were that were what were some of the first threads that you started to hug at that blew your mind well really it was when i took this three-year trip around the world in the early 1990s. I started out as an English teacher in Japan for 14 months. And as I said, I self-finance all my trips and then took off of the backpack, which was one of the most liberating experiences of my life. I remember a moment on the Nullarbar plane in Australia and all I had on was a backpack and I was hitchhiking all the way across Australia. And it just dawned on me that this is the most freedom expression that a person could have to have so little, not even a lot of money, but enough to get on my way. And I just stood there in the desert and I was like, this is it. I've arrived. And I felt like I had reached that pinnacle of travel that there's nowhere on the planet. I cannot go. And in fact, I proved that correct uh, about three and a half years ago when I went down to Antarctica on a sailboat and rounded out all seven continents. So now that I've done that, I'm moving on to act three, and that is uh, getting this ranch in Nevada, which I just uh, closed on and starting work on that. But I definitely intend to continue to travel. For me, that has been the most eye-opening and awakening experience to be able to go to other cultures, see the megalithic constructions in South America and Egypt. And uh, I climbed the Great Pyramid in 1993. So I've had all these incredible travel moment experiences that have built my worldview and and allowed me to share some of these experiences and and look back on the history, the the antediluvian civilizations that once worked their magic here on this planet and built these megalithic constructions for example i'm going out to boulder colorado next month for the gaia sphere conference and i just prepared a brand new presentation on the early maps like the perry reese map which shows islands under the ice in antarctica how would they know that and how they have started to appear and also tying it in with the builder race that uh put together these massive polygonal megalithic constructions, not just in South America, but around the world. 
So I think there's quite a bit of evidence that uh, the history that we've been told <laughs> is largely been edited, and that's putting it <laughs> fairly lightly. Uh, but uh, to keep us from knowing our past is one way of defrauding us. That's part of the false matrix, is not allowing us to know who we really are on this planet. So is was that, what was the moment then where you started to see the the agenda that like, what were some of those, those moments where you're like, Oh, this is the, I was, I believe this for, you know, 20 years or whatever. And it's a lie. Like what yeah. were some of those moments where you were like, uh Oh, I just read, you know, we didn't, we didn't have red pill reference back in the day, but like, I just red pilled myself where I, I just saw through that. Like what were some of the things that first initially kind of woke you up and you're like, Oh my God, it's bigger than I thought. Yeah. That's a great question. I think for me, it was really realizing that nine 11, 2001, the attacks in New York were not as they appeared or not as the government narrative, even the mainstream media narrative was telling us. Why did it have to be alternative media that really showed the other side to that? And let me remind you, 9-11 has still not been resolved as far as who the real perpetrators were, how those buildings came down, and to honor the 3,000 plus dead because real people do die sometimes in false flag operations. Oh, yeah. And so totally. for their memory alone, we deserve to bring them justice and in just knowing what really happened that day. So like the old Abraham Lincoln quote, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. How many times do we have to be deceived to know that this is a false matrix and it's festooning upon us this uh, false narrative about who we are and what is going on. But more importantly, to your question, this was this uh, crossing the Rubicon moment where I was like, hey, no way. It didn't go down that way. And it, it's opening Pandora's box. So once you do that in the old parable of ancient Greece, once Pandora opened the box, you cannot get that back in. Okay. So yeah, I don't care if uh, 60 Minutes comes out with some new information about 9-11. It's all going to be a, a scam. So you can't put it back in the box anymore. Once you know these things, they become part of your protection, your knowledge, and, and your information base that you can work upon. So that, that's why I often think like in, in terms of, uh, let's say somebody really wanted to become a black belt in karate. Well, you can't just walk into the studio someday and say, okay, I'll buy that black belt and that karate suit and I'll put it on. Hey, look at me. I'm a black belt. No, it didn't work that way. You work for that black belt for years until you achieve that black belt ability. And then you are a black belt. But you see, by then it becomes your power. That is something you worked very hard to achieve. And once you achieve that and you become this black belt in karate, it's with you for the rest of your life. So mm -hmm. unpacking a lot of these esoteric subjects is very similar. You got to put the work in. You got to really look at it from every angle to get to some semblance of truth. It's kind of like peeling the layers off of an onion. Sometimes the more you peel off and the deeper you go, the more questions and more of a mystery is opening up. But keep going and you'll start to see this reality the real reality of this world start to unfold well then let's take it from there because i think that's a good wake-up point i mean I, I remember that also being for me where like you start to hear these alternative narratives and um you start to question and for me it was a long time to want it was very difficult <laughs> to like want to accept that like our government had did not have our best intention our government was you know oh gosh just corrupt to the core i mean to be honest and um to kind of step outside of that because there's that thing of wanting to believe that somebody's in charge and they know what they're doing somebody cares about me mommy and daddy care about me and they're taking care of me the best they can and to realize that like you're actually in the wilderness on your own because and you have to defend yourself against people that are vampiric in nature pretending to have your best interests I'm, I'm wondering what else where the thread began to um or where the tapestry began to unravel 
from there, like what else did you start to pick up? Because these are going to be in your books, right? All these things that you've learned that you've learned are in your books. So I'm just wondering what were some of the other things that you're like, well, if that's true, then what about that? Well, what about that? And like other things started to pop on for you. What did you start to see? Exactly. And that and that's that analogy with peeling the layers off the onion, because it brings you in to different subjects. Well, if 9-11 was a false flag, what else have they been up to? What mm -hmm. about all these other ones that come up that have more mysteries uh, surrounding them? But always remember the uh, Hegelian dialectic, the uh, problem, reaction, solution. This is an age old technique of getting the people of the world to go along with a certain agenda. And many times it's with a false flag attack. I mean, that goes all the way back to the age of the pirates uh, hundreds wow. of years ago when, when a, a, a pirate ship would put up the flag of an oncoming ship. Maybe it's the British uh, admiralty coming in to see who it is. Oh, it's one of our ships. Then they'd position the ship and hit it with cannon. And it, it, it's all based on deception. So I think unraveling all of this has led me to see that there is so much deception in the world. It's called a false matrix for a good reason, because just about everything of importance has been withheld from us. So what were some of the other things that started to come into your awareness? Like after 9-11, what were some of the things that you, you can like maybe give us some, um, what do I say, some points along your map of, of uh, awakening in the matrix? Well, certainly by traveling around the world and seeing many of these megalithic sites, that had instilled in me that there, that history as we know it is completely skewed, that we are not getting the big picture at all. Uh, that was actually pre-9-11. I started thinking along those mm. lines. After 9-11, just about every false flag becomes very apparent. Uh, and in fact, very quickly. And, and I do get into the neo-fascism uh, that we're we're dealing with now and how uh, for the awakened people, these false flags, they don't work anymore. <laughs> I have a little funny little graphic meme here, uh, even how to spot a false flag. But yeah, your false flags don't work anymore. We are awake. And once people become awake, it, you can't fool them so easily anymore. So that was one side of it. And then just seeing how our government got hijacked, a little known act of 1871 in that particular year turned the United States into a corporation. And I start in the neo-fascist chapter to help people understand that you know how on your birth certificate or on your driver's license, your name is always in caps. Hmm, that's interesting. I wonder why. Well, that is because you are chattel to this corporation. You are traded as a commodity, as in this corporation. We are their assets, right? So the, the years that we're productive and we live and work and pay taxes, another big scam. Remember what happened? Remember our, this country was founded on the principle, no taxation without representation, and now the IRS is getting all these arms and they're going to start storming houses. Hmm. Seems like we might have another Boston Tea Party percolating out there in the near future. So isn't it interesting how history repeats? Because if we don't know our history, if we don't know where we've come from, we're not going to be able to recognize the telltale signs of this kind of emerging fascism, not only in this country, but around the world. And look, we are traveling right along the edge of a razor right now. On one side could be this timeline to absolute fascism, new world order, nuclear holocaust, destroyed this planet. I mean, we're seeing it right now. But on the other side, timeline one, this is human race entering the golden age. And this is what we all need to put our focus on. And another thing that is so vitally important that I've learned along the way is our thoughts, even just our projection of what kind of future we want to have is vitally important, so much more powerful than anybody's given it credit for. And so that is how we can make this change. That is consciousness being the revolution that we find ourselves in right now. Well, let's bring it back to 1871 and it kind of breaks that down for us. Cause when you, when you drop like 
big bits of data like that, you got to unpack it so people can be with you in it. So, so how did the government become a corporation? Like what was the, what was the transformation point? The day the Republic died, I mean, I'll get many pages in the book explaining it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, the day the America became a corporation. The United States exists in two forms, the admiralty jurisdiction and your birth certificate bond is worth billions. Admiralty just jurisdiction. What does that mean? Admiralty jurisdiction. Uh, okay, I'll read some to you. The power <laughs> controls America. The book. Well, this is important <laughs> to know. I mean, we can only really delve into some of the little highlights here. But if this is something you think uh, should be cleared well, up, yeah, for people to... Jordan Maxwell, and he spoke on this. Uh, very eloquently and and had the great honor and privilege of, of working with him and talking with him one-on-one -on -one quite a bit. So he brought me up to speed on a lot of this material. Unfortunately, he just passed uh, a few months ago. Um, but this is what's so interesting is that all of this admiralty jurisdiction is founded on Roman law because the Illuminati has been playing the same game throughout the centuries. These are multi-generational families that go all the way back at least until the Middle Ages, the, uh, the, the money banking families of Italy in the Middle Ages are still at it. They're multi-generational family lines. These bloodline families are still going at it. So I call a spade a spade, and I call these people out for exactly what they are and what they're doing, because it is to jail us it is to imprison us it is to create this prison planet of all of us and they don't want uh going on eight billion of us alive uh, the former georgia guidestone said quite clearly they wanted to keep humanity within the realm of 500 million people that is a 90 percent plus reduction of the world population so they state their goals very clearly this is called the um they they have to reveal themselves so it's the revelation of the method it's a very occultic way of them putting this over on us but saying hey we told you what we were up to so this admiralty jurisdiction has been going on for centuries the major politicians know that this is how things are and so the government administrators judges lawyers and insider journalists so in Jordan Maxwell's slideshow presentation called Hidden Symbols, had this to say, quote, if you notice on the bottom of your birth certificate, it says Department of Commerce. It is a property to the Department of Commerce because you are nothing more than a piece of commercial material. That's why you're out of work. You don't go to the unemployment office. You go to the Office of Human Resources because you're just a human resource, Jordan Maxwell. So, so what happened in 1871? Well, let's put it in historical context. So it's right after the Civil War. Ulysses S. Grant, who is largely regarded as one of the worst presidents, he was a great war general, helped the North win that conflict, but he was terrible. He's an alcoholic, raging alcoholic. Why he's on the $50 bill, well, I think, because he signed this into law. But it was really a very corrupt Congress as well. You had all the carpetbaggers going down to the South, exploiting uh, the South, uh, the Jim Crow laws. So the slaves really weren't freed entirely. They became indentured servants. But most importantly, this country was broke. Abraham Lincoln tried to put us onto a treasury note again. And those were called the greenbacks. They were the first green dollar bill notes. That's where the name came from. He, of course, was assassinated, just like John F. Kennedy, who tried mm. to put us onto treasury notes again. Uh, Jim Mars, who I got a great chance to meet and even hang out with uh, before he passed, he had the old $2 and $5 red treasury notes. There are dollar bills that look just like ours, but they were tinted red. And they said, U.S. Treasury note. And Kennedy was in the process 
of bringing back sound money to this country. And keep in mind, in the time of JFK, it was still gold-backed currency. Nixon took us off the gold standard 51 years ago. And ever since then, it's been fiat currency. It is worth mm. only the perception that we give it. You see, uh, it, it's really based on nothing except our perception that it holds value. And so when that goes back to any country, including Zimbabwe, goes back to a gold-based currency, it's, it's going to wipe out all the fiats. Who, What currency trader is going to want a fiat when they could put their money behind a gold-backed currency? That's why the, currently there is not a single one. There can't be. And that's why these... Uh, these bloodline families, these uh, which owns and controls the Federal Reserve in this country and all the central banks around the world, except for a few, which happen to be the access of evil, right? So anybody who goes against this standard, they got our military, more importantly, our the CIA will go in there and assassinate presidents, change uh, governments. I mean, we've been doing this for decades. And mm -hmm. I do write about a lot of these shenanigans in Beyond Esoteric to give people an idea how deep and how long this has been going on. So basically, U Ulysses um, was the one that said, yep, it's OK to make people into currency, basically, or people into into property. Like the, Mer the American citizens are now property of the government. The government's more going to run like a corporation. Right. And we'll make money through people and use them kind of like a battery as opposed to providing for them. Is that, am I getting the gist? You, you are getting the gist. And also keep in mind that all three of the city states that control the Western world, this is very occultic. And occult basically means that which is hidden. But in Washington, D.C., we have a giant obelisk called the Washington Monument. It's the tallest monument in DC. No building is allowed to go higher than the Washington Monument. And you have a big mall. Uh, I even have uh, some charts in here showing Washington DC as it's being planned out. The city, uh, the grids, there's so much occultic side of Washington DC uh, that basically as a planned city. What is DC? District of Columbia. Okay. It is not a state. Okay. It is not uh, what we would refer to as the re Republic. So shortly after this act of 1871, DC broke off into its own city state. Now, where else is there a city state? Oh, that happens to have an obelisk in the middle of it. Well, that would be in Vatican City, right in the center of Rome. They are their own country, their own laws, their own post office, their own police. And they have a big Egyptian obelisk right in the middle of St. Peter's Square. And then the third in the empire of the city is the city of London. It's a one square mile right along the River Thames. And if you were to walk along the River Thames, you would see the needle of Cleopatra, another obelisk another occult symbol saying this is who we are. And each one of these are independent city states within the nation. They make their own laws and they are not obliged to follow the laws of the nation that surrounds them. So this is how they did it. This is really a, a nutshell version of how the Western moneyed elite were able to game the system and control the governments around them. Excuse me. <clears throat> so in, in, the, in the District of Columbia, then they have their own set of laws that are not mirrored within the rest of the United States? That's correct. What or so Do you know what some of those laws are? Well, for example, they are uh, exempt from many of the laws of the land as we would know them. But I'll give you an example. This whole January 6th debacle there are still people sitting in jail from that January 6, 2001, that have not received a fair trial. So we have it in our books in this country that everybody is allowed a speedy trial. Why are they sitting in jail for over a year? So things do not apply in the same way. You see, this empire of three cities, Washington, D.C., 
is the political military might. Okay. City of London is the financial sector that finances everything. And then Vatican, supposedly the spiritual side of things. Right? <laughs> well, the dark, the dark, the dark religion. Yeah, now it's starting to be revealed that yeah. everything is inverted here, you guys. This is the esoteric nature of everything. Whatever they say is our reality. Just think the opposite and you're pretty close to the real truth, okay? Because <laughs> everything gets inverted by these guys. That's the cultic way. The revelation yeah. of the method is to show us in very veiled symbols and forms of what they're up to. But in reality, <laughs> they're working against the people every step of the way. Absolutely. Well, let's. I want to talk about the Georgia Stones next, but I wanted to see if Linda or Jason wanted to hop in. Um, so I'm not being a guest hog. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, and you always hear stories, especially with the Vatican about the vaults, right? Like oh, yeah. what do they have in the vaults? Like there's, you know, you talk about our history has been hidden from us. Right. And I, I'm kind of like one to question, well, how much do they really know? Right. And how much do they really know that they're not sharing? And is, does this tie into some of the items that they have, like the supposed items that they have, in the Vatican that they're just not releasing. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, you, you're on to something there. And I'll tell you that there are many secrets below the Vatican, uh, as well as tunnels that are said to extend all the way under the Mediterranean Sea to Jerusalem, uh, filled with gold. So keep this in mind. Who? How is it that virtually every country of the world is in debate debilitating debt. Most people that we know are carrying credit cards, student loan debt. It seems like everybody and everything, every government is in debt. But to who? Saturn? <laughs> I mean, who, who controls all this wealth, especially after we just created all these trillions and trillions of dollars and all the other countries of the world went along with it too. That's why the dollar didn't crash. Yeah, we, we created all these trillions of dollars right out of thin air, but all the other countries went along with it. You see, this is the globalist plan to enslave all of us. Remember the old uh, World Economic Forum? You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Yeah, they're buying up all the houses, so you will own nothing. And they're even going 10, 15% over asking price for apartment blocks and single family homes. So everybody's a renter, and then they that's when they got you, when, when you cannot even uh, have the luxury of owning your own place. And the founding fathers knew this. They said, when we lose our ability to own private property, we're going to become slaves to these, uh, these moneyed family. And so we really have to call a spade a spade here and see who is controlling all this. And this is this moneyed elite these bloodline families, which have been around for quite a long time and are going for it right now. This is the move that David Icke would often say that, that they're planning this behind boardrooms, but there will come a day when they have to go outward and overboard where everybody's going to see what their plans and intentions are, but they feel like we'll be powerless to be able to stand up to them. And even Klaus Schwab, he said, oh, well, we know people are going to protest our plans. Yeah, why do you think? Because you're trying to enslave the entire human race. And so I'm just in my way trying to expose this. And I'm, I'm glad mm. you guys are interested in this subject so we can talk about it. And of course, I go into much greater detail in my book about how they're doing it. But uh, this is very important for people to understand because we are really up against the wall right now. And if this is allowed to go through, it'll be the worst form of fascism we can ever imagine because now it's gone high tech, right? Now, now there's AI. Now there is uh, nanoparticles that are getting into our blood and, and changing the physicality of what it means to be a human. So we are now going into human 2.0 as we speak. And I know there's certain subjects we can't talk about, but I think your listeners are. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we try to use when it gets into certain things. We try to use. We try to be very generous with our language, so YouTube doesn't censor us. Um, why did you say who we who do they pay Saturn? Why did you say Saturn? <laughs> well, Saturn is the occultic planet. 
Saturn is what, if you go really deep into this, is this extraterrestrial malevolent ET influence, even a form of consciousness is coming out of Saturn. Did you know at the top of Saturn is a perfect hexagram? It never changes. That is a six pointed. Uh, yeah, I've even got a picture of it in here. Let's see if I can pull it up real quick. But Saturn has a lot to do with the occult agenda. Saturn has always been this uh, planet, of course, with the rings of Saturn. It's a very unique looking planet. There's nothing quite like it in our solar system. And in those rings of Saturn uh, is, is, a, is a form of asteroid belt. That is what the uh, rings of Saturn are, mm -hmm. are particles. And in those rings of Saturn are uh, some bases, some ET uh, locations where they are doing things to the planet. That and the dark side of the moon, which is now known to be mostly hollow. And in those locations, uh, including on the planetoid series in the asteroid belt, are actual bases within some of these planetoids where these malevolent service to self ETs have been operating, as well as right here underneath the ground on planet Earth. You know how we've often heard the whole story Oh, look to the skies. Extraterrestrials are coming down from far, far away. What about the inner terrestrials right here underneath our feet? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we know that there are deep underground military bases, these dumbs all over the country. It's absolutely proven fact that there are 130 or more of these underground bases. So it should not come as much of a stretch to say that there are other interterrestrial environments and some of them are these blood sucking even feeding off of human not only physical bodies but our emotional state and that's called louche and and that is why they like to keep us in a fear or anger state because when you're there you're actually emanating a food source to this arconic network uh the this third uh aspect of extraterrestrials and that is the ultra terrestrials okay and that is that is going into the unseen realms because they are actually able to phase in and out of our reality so you want to talk about ha having this moment of understanding as it relates to exopolitics and the abilities of some of these extraterrestrials this is when it goes really deep. I mean, this is about uh, down as down the rabbit hole as you can go. But once you understand that we are a food source to a lot of these malevolent service to self ETs, this then ties into human abductions and cattle mutilations and how they're able to operate here on this planet. Boy, it does start to all come together. And that little guy over your shoulder there, Jason, uh, <laughs> might be uh, in that category. So are you, I heard something the other day, um, uh, it was primarily around reptilian, right? The reptilian species. And it had to do with, well, oh. look, look at him trying to keep me from sharing my truth. Um, <laughs> it, had, it had to do with the invasion in Ukraine. Um, there's a theory that the invasion really, it's, even though we see it as this negative, oh, Putin's invading the Ukraine, right? Um, and I don't remember what show it was. It may have been a show with Tyler, um, Tyler's podcast. One of his guests was talking about it, um, that they were really going in to try to wipe out this reptilian species or race that's up under, right? It's underground, but there's like a base there. There's this conglomerate of the, the species. What's your take on that? Uh, great question. And I'm aware of that uh, through my colleague Carrie Cassidy in Project Camelot, she was one of the first to break the story when the whole uh, Ukraine war exploded in February and saying they're going to go for this base. It's in a small mountain range in southern Ukraine. And I do believe that Russia has not only taken over that area above it, but probably penetrated into the base itself. 
as well as what they called Snake Island, which is one of these bio labs. That was one of the very first things that Russia did was take out 30 some bio hazard laboratories that were working against the Slavic people. This is how deep and deceivious this whole mission went. And I would say that once again, everything's inverted. What you hear on the news and going on in Ukraine is quite the opposite of what's really going on. Boy, now that they're shelling this nuclear power plant, things are getting pretty serious over there now. And they're even threatening to take out the decision-making places where these orders are coming in to the Ukrainians, namely London and the Pentagon. Russia has just said, you better stop this because if you keep on shelling and uh, threatening th this nuclear power plant, one of the largest ones in Europe, it's already sh showing plumes of radiation coming out from it. This is very serious. This, this could be another Chernobyl on our hands. Mm. And if it is being done purposefully, these are acts of war. So you guys, we are so very close to this timeline too, which the globalists absolutely want. War mm. has been very, very profitable for these oh, yeah. bloodline families because they're the loners. They loan at interest <laughs> for wars. What better? Uh, and, and everything gets destroyed in wars, right? So you need more capital to rebuild. So yeah. what? Part and it ties back into the, you know, how our population is higher than what they want it to be. What is we're going to do? It brings death, right? So it lowers the total population on the planet. There's that. And it keeps us in a fear state. And so mm -hmm. people that are living in war zones are, are quite desperate and angry and fearful. And that's playing into the whole loosh notion that we are uh, emanating a food source through our emotional state. Yeah, again, they're creating the problem, but pretending to offer the solution. And from my understanding, like, you know, like, is it, there's this whole thing of NATO being one of the arms looking to have greater and greater control. And so it's like, you know, but they're they're framed as the hero, but it's like NATO has no good intentions other than amassing more control. And, you know, there's a defiance from Russia against that because they don't want to become docile on that. That's my understanding. So there's so many levels and layers, but Miss Linda, get your voice in here. What would you like to ask? Actually, I'm trying to catch up with comments, but oh, okay. um, <laughs> I actually had a lot of curiosity more about patterns over history since you have, since you have um, researched ancient history on up, what are those patterns that you see that can help guide us in the future? You know, yeah. in dealing with everything. Yeah, that's a great question. Really recognizing patterns is a very big part of peeling these layers off to understand how these operations have been uh, put upon us for so long. And one of those patterns as it relates to history are the finding of giant bones, for example, around the world. You sure don't hear about that. Actually, what you hear about in the 19th century, newspaper headlines, uh, stories. I have a, uh, a chapter in Beyond Esoteric called Suppressed Human Origins, where uh, even a dig with uh, professional archaeologists, from uh, Beloit College in Wisconsin was doing a dig at Lake Delavan, finding these giant bones with the elongated heads with uh, sometimes six fingers, six digits. They are human-like, but they're not human. Well, let me tell you something. I was just at a conference up in Mount Shasta last month, and Alex Collier made a very rare appearance. He doesn't do many conferences. In fact, the last one he's going to do is in October, which I'll also be a speaker at in Orlando, Florida. And go to bradolson.com and find out my conference schedule and find out about that event. And how, I think there's still some tickets available. But Alex was doing this Q&A at uh, Mount Shasta. And somebody asked him, who owns the earth? And his answer was the Anunnaki. And I would propose that those giant bones, 
the megalithic sites, the antediluvian civilization was this Anunnaki species, human-like, but not human. And when you examine these elongated skulls, you'll notice there's no central suture crack that every human has, that the cranial capacity is 30% larger than ours. The eyeball socket is 30% larger than ours. So presumably a larger head, a much larger body. Here's the answer to all these giant bones found around the world, that this is the progenitor race, that they created us using genetic technology to infuse not only their DNA, but some of the proto-humans such as Neanderthal or uh, Cro-Magnon man to create modern humans. So even Francis Crick, who uh, was one of the co-discoverers of DNA has said, for the homo sapien human race to emerge as quickly as they would, it would be like going to a yard sale with an entire 747 disassembled and, and having an amateur put it all together. So he said it's about that impossible, suggesting that we were genetically manipulated, that we were created as this slave race who was smart enough to follow orders and go down into the old mines of South Africa to collect the gold for them, but dumb enough never to question authority. That's what they wanted out of the human race. And so that's why this great awakening we're experiencing now is such an exciting time because for the very first time, the human race is saying, hey, wait a minute, I'm a sovereign being here. You can't control me anymore. But boy, they'll try as hard as they might. I hope that answers your question in part. I think that connects a lot to the Tower of Babel. Do you know who Paul Wallace is? Yes, I do. Oh yeah. gosh, you guys should be on a show great. together. That would be great yeah. to have you two together. Um, because he talks about you know how the, the Tower of Babel was when people were telepathic and they were able to communicate, and it was like, oh, they know too much, we're gonna dumb them down because their genetics are working too well. And so that's how we got to this level of um compliance. Um, is because things were turned off and it was like, and then the, you know, the whole programming of, oh, only your five senses, anything beyond your five senses, that's crazy. That's woo woo. You can't prove that scientifically. And that's been such a part of the narrative. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could kind of maybe point out for people who are just coming into this, because it could get very deep and heavy. And so I just want to remind everybody that like you are sovereign inside of the matrix. You're still sovereign. You're still like, no matter what happens, you are a sovereign soul. We are consciousness playing through time and space in these bodies in this density, but you are not limited to this. I do think like Elizabeth Anglin was saying last week that there's this vast galactic corporation out there that does own things, you know, but the, the, but we, again, that's as real as we allow it to be, as we, you know, agree for it to be. And popping on, turning on within our consciousness is how we take that back. But in the journey of us seeing that we are kind of basting in this, um, in this, occult, uh, nefarious occult um, structure, for mm -hmm. lack of better words here, there are symbologies that show up that kind of uh, are hidden in plain sight. Because again, that's that's the esoteric things are like can be hidden in plain sight. Would you sort of reveal some of the symbols that people can start to clock so they can track, start to begin to track that on their own? Because people have to come to that understanding or not within their own being. We can't just say, this is true now, wake up, wake up. Like people have to have that journey of themselves. So what are some of the symbols that we can start to like look for over and over again? Great question. And I have a whole chapter in Modern Esoteric, the first book in this series called Sacred Symbols. And symbols are hugely important in deciphering and understanding this whole false matrix. In fact, many ways, symbols are more revealing and descriptive than words themselves. Symbols are actually how people communicate telepathically through symbolic image forms. And it's, it's said to be even more of an exact form of communication than speaking. Because symbols hold a lot of keys to a lot of different 
uh, agendas that are going on in the world. Every one of these bloodline families, for example, has a symbol, their own family crest. And within them, oh boy, some of them are quite revealing where you can find dragons and and other uh, I- indications that they're allied with, with these malevolent ETs, including uh, the Draco reptilians who have had a presence on this planet for thousands of years. They are interterrestrials. They are service to self. They have been allied with the Anunnaki for thousands of years. And therefore they also feel their own sense of dominion over this planet. And as such, this is how they work around this prime directive, this whole notion that no extraterrestrial uh, group is allowed to interfere with the development of an advancing civilization such as Earth. But if they're of this planet, you see, that's their workaround. They are allowed to interfere because they are also Earthlings. Now, we as the humans on the surface of this planet uh, are offered this dominion of of ruling over. In fact, the uh, the elite or the royalties of Europe who have quite a hand in uh, controlling this country, they say they have the divine right to rule. Okay, so they feel that God has appointed them the right to rule over the rest of us. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and that's in the form of symbols. So I hope this is, is kind of answering the question in a roundabout way. But the symbols are so vitally important in, in understanding the whole wheel work of how so many things are operating on this planet. Uh, we r- would highly recommend people check out that chapter called sacred symbols because they can also work both ways these symbols can also be uh how we communicate in mathematics for example through sacred geometry to understand the full uh how 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 nature works how uh cells divide for example becomes the vescus pisces and then into the seed of life into the flower of life and this is a symbol that is etched upon the Osirian temple in Egypt, one of the oldest, and it's a megalithic temple with the flower of life laser etched into the temple. And I have pictures of that in modern esoteric. So to understand these symbols is also to understand the actual beginning of life and life itself. So really vitally important, but veiled in this category where if you don't want to see it, or if you're you're, you're not going to put in the time and effort like that expert becoming a black belt in karate, you're not going to get there because they're not going to make it easy for you. But if you are, you can find it. You can find your way and you can get to the answers of a lot of these age old questions that we've had through symbols. Well, and maybe say what some of this particular people can go to the book and see some of that, but maybe if you could speak to it, because I know that um, that was one of the things in my own, like realizing that <laughs> realizing of the matrix that we're, you know, in this um, belief, par- it's like this energetic belief grid or energetic intentional grid. Um, but there's always that thing with, you know, with the Illuminati covering up one eye or getting, having a black eye. So, I mean, that's, and that has to do, goes back to like the eye on top of the pyramid. Um, and all of these things originally are like neutral and beautiful symbols, um, but then are co-opted from my understanding to, for their own agenda. But maybe you could point out some of the symbols that people could look at, look, start to look for visually and and they are some in your book there are some like you give a whole list of logos of like company logos and maybe you can just kind of tell us what some of the trademark features are to look for and why why they mean something right well i I, yeah the great question i have a whole talk um, i'm giving at conferences now called the hidden esoteric in plain sight and it's almost all of these logos from company logos Uh, wow so many phallic symbols I'll give you an example. How about Amazon Prime? You looked at that logo lately, the sort of- It's supposed to be a smile, but I guess you could see it as a phallic symbol. You could see it as a smile. You could also see it as something else. (laughs) Uh, 
How about the, I'll uh, never look at it the same. You'll never will. That's all <laughs> symbols. Once you see it, you'll never forget it. And well, you brought up the seeing eye. Great example. Well, there it is on the back of the one dollar bill. Uh, what does it say in, in Latin? The new order of ages, pretty similar to New World Order, uh, with the unfinished pyramid. This is really important to understand. And it's on in every one of our wallets right now. Who doesn't have a $1 bill, right? And you're, you're using it as a form of currency. So you're using these occ occultic symbols to get what you need in the world today. Mm. So in a way, you are compliant. You mm. are using it. Therefore, <laughs> you are part of the plan, whether you want to or not. But you see, we live on a free will planet. And this is why this is so important to understand. Because we have the free will to make decisions on our own. Of course, we're highly influenced in certain ways to make decisions the way they want us to. But if you can opt out of that and make the right decisions, you'll find that a lot of things change for you in your life. But let's go back to that seeing eye. That seeing eye can be seen in a lot of places around the world. The first place I saw it was in Vietnam in a, a temple just on the Cambodian border in a town called Tay Ninh. And I was one of the very first backpackers allowed into Vietnam um, shortly after they, and I found this out with the uh, Ken Burns series on Vietnam, right after they closed the last of the re-education camps, just six months later, here I am backpacking around with these two Australians that we taught English together in Japan. And everywhere we go, they call us Linkso, which means Russian, because they hadn't seen tall white people since the Russians were there, who put in all these really awful architecturally uh, bla bland buildings all over Vietnam. So you could totally tell where the Russians had uh, done some building. And so we go out and we needed a travel permit and had to have the names of all the uh, places we we're going. And fortunately, one of my Australian friends knew about Tain Inn and we put it on our travel permit and we went out there and here it is the seeing eye in a triangle in this temple of Tain Inn. I'm like, that's really weird. And turns out that this was a religion that was based on several mystics from Europe, including Victor Hugo, the novelist from France, who was uh, being channeled um, to, to use these symbols in all these different ways. Well, the Vatican uses the seeing eye. You can find it in churches and chapels and various places around the world. And there it is on our dollar bill. So what do all these things have in common? Well, it's the eye of providence that is watching you, watching over you, mm. and, and giving you that sense that there is this higher authority Look, big brother watching you, uh, right? taking a page right out of the George Orwell 1984 playbook. That's big brother in symbol form. Once you know it, you'll never forget it. Once you see it, you'll always see it everywhere you go. But if you don't see it, you see that's how your free will works. If you don't see it, well, then you're just an ignorant sheeple then, aren't you? Well, so they like to keep us in that box of ignorance. Yeah, and we don't want to, you know, judge people because <laughs> everyone's in their, everyone's in their lane, and some people aren't here to wake up. Like their soul didn't come in to wake up. That wasn't part of their soul agreement. Others, it is, and and they're, you know, they aren't they aren't reaching it because it's so dense here. Um, I mean, that's one of the perils of coming here. It's like as a soul, you look at the planet, you're like, oh, I'm gonna come in. I'll do this. I'll take on that challenge. And you get here and it's so thick. It's like, oh, yeah. oh, like trying to wake up and, and activate your program is really, really challenging. So, you know, if you're here, hats off, it's really fucking hard. And I just want to applaud you for, for showing up and, you know, going through the uh, trauma that we're all going through being here, being in this crazy upside down planet. Um, and I'll kind of along those lines, you know, in terms of, people being fed um it's kind of like you're you're forced to agree like well if you want to if you want to have money if you want to buy anything you got to have money so you're forced to participate right. and you know that kind of brings us into all this legislation that gets passed in the in the darkness of in the of night where things are put through that are completely horrific 
for civil rights. Um, and I, when, I think it was in your book that I saw, it was the Affordable Cares Act includes the de decapitation by a guillotine. Yeah. Would you would you expand that one because a Affordable Cares Act, but there's a guillotine. Wait, expand on that for us. <laughs> yeah, they're they're in FEMA camps. Why? Because bullets are more expensive and a limited commodity. But boy, you can just chop off as many heads as you want if. Uh, you get them into these camps it, it, and they're all over the country, by the way, if, if you don't know about that, you should know. Uh, break, it I was down. On, break it down. Hey, let me tell you, I was on the show buzzsaw with Sean stone, the son of Oliver stone and Tyrell Ventura, son of Jesse Ventura. And we're just talking before we start the show. And I said, Hey guys, what happened to conspiracy theory with Jesse Ventura? That was the best show on TV. And uh, we weren't rolling then. And they kind of looked at each other because Sean Stone was on the show in season three. And they said, uh, well, <laughs> we got into a little trouble in season two when we did the expose on the FEMA camps. And then they showed all of these, um, these plastic tomb containers so they could just bury people very rapidly. And so they, they got into a FEMA camp or, or at least got right up to the fence where you could see all of just stacks and stacks and stacks, thousands of these coffin containers in one of these FEMA camps. I believe it was in Georgia that they were filming this in. Well, boy, the federal government didn't like that. They came a knocking and said, uh, mm, you're canceled <laughs> for next season. And they said, well, wait, 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 we, we can't just cancel. We've already signed with True TV, which was their number one show like they would want to cancel their number one show of all time. We can't just cancel it. We've already announced a season three coming up. We've already signed. They said, well, tell you what, you will never talk about any of this again. And they said, well, what can we talk about? And Sean Stone had just come out with a documentary about a haunted psychiatric ward in New York state. They said, talk about those things. Talk about ghosts. And then they did an episode on Skinwalker Ranch. They did episodes on the paranormal, uh, Bigfoot. Talk about all that, but do not talk about the overreach of the federal government and these FEMA camps. And in fact, they did cancel them after season three by not uh, announcing when new episodes were going to be on in TV Guide and all the various way so of course if people didn't know when the new episode was on nobody's going to watch it oh the ratings tanked and now we're going to have to cancel you that's right. the backstory to why conspiracy theory got canceled because when you go a little too deep on these subjects uh mm, they don't like that including the guillotines in these fema camps and who who authorized that uh none other than comey himself uh, brought a lot of those in about a decade ago. And uh, the rumor mill says he's been dealt with in that way. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. That I have not heard. Uh, I mean, but I did find an article that says Obama and who WHO world health organization codes legalized executions by beheading comma loss of privacy. So I did put that article in our I mean, this is the first time me seeing the article. I haven't researched it. I can't verify reliable source, all that stuff. But it's in there for people to research. So I did put it in our, our stream chat. Um, and, I, and I think that that is one of the things where it's like the, the horrors of what's going on versus, hey, look at this over here. And like, you know, like, because if I focused on all those horrors, I just wouldn't get out of bed. I'd be like, great, I'll come back in 800 years. Maybe we'll see what the planet's better then. And I would just be gone because I just, it's, it's overwhelming. So it maybe is. a good question is, is how do you navigate your own sanity once you start to see all this and you start to see the the false flags and the manipulations and the systematic oppression. I mean, gosh, I think about just the imprisonment of people of color. Like there's a, there's a hardcore effort to imprison specifically people of color because it's part of our history. And 
you know, and, and, and white people would be like, oh, not me, but like, it's easier to do with people of color because their oppression's already systematized is in our system. But like, that's the new workforce is the, is the, um, is the jail force, like arrest more people. So you have a better free workforce. So um, how do you maintain a positive or optimistic or, you know, not nihilistic uh, take on the world when you're surrounded by all of this? Well, as a friend of mine who suffers from depression said, your greatest gift, your greatest uh, asset was that he says you were born with the happy gene. And, and I, I, I've never been depressed a day in my life. I have a lot of compassion for people that do. I know there's, there's a lot of mental anguish and suffering that comes with depression it's just something I've never experienced. So I guess I don't really know it entirely, but I think that's how I did it is, is I've always been optimistic. I've always kept my mental state very high where I'm laughing every day. I'm, I'm Even if there's wrong in the world, I try to make fun of it. You see, because sarcasm is something that these global elite can't handle. John Lennon had a great quote. He said, the establishment, they're going to try to poke you. They're going to tug at your beard and they're going to do anything they can to incite you to violence because once you go violent, they got you. Okay. And that's why I absolutely never advocate violence. But he also said, if you inject sarcasm and humor into what their plan is and shed light on it that way, they have no defense. That's why memes are so popular because they can cut right to the source of the injustice or the hypocrisy and, and show people in a very simple way how these things have gone so wrong and they can't fight it back. That's why uh, one of the Rockefellers said early on in the age of uh, the internet when people started becoming more awakened and this is why there's such intense censorship now, but one of the Rockefellers said, we should have never let the internet become usable to all the people. We should have kept it in a state of national security. So they do not like this great awakening. And that's why they're coming down on us so harshly with censorship. But what I do is I just keep myself at a very positive state every day. I mean, even seeing the injustices of the world, this just gives me more motivation to fight against this injustice mm. by waking people up and, and giving them that opportunity. Cause you mentioned it earlier that everybody is at their own pace. People are going to just wake up when they find something like a nine 11 moment, their red pill journey. And, and that's up to them. All we can do is, is give them some guideposts along the way and you know, the mile markers on the road and say, Hey, you're on the right path. Just keep mm. on going. There's a lot more to it and keep unveiling those layers of the onion. And it goes deep. It goes real deep folks, it's but real uh, deep. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> well, I want to ask Nancy, uh, Nancy legit, one of our um, members, uh, she says this, I just want to, you, maybe you could respond to it, uh, Brad. I don't understand how or why a medical claim would be filed on an execution unless a prison had to file a claim in order to be reimbursed for the drugs if it was a chemical execution. Does that make sense? Um, sort of. Is she referring to guillotine? I think that's, yeah, we're, it was from that conversation. I don't understand how or why a medical claim, which would be the Affordable Cares Act, would be filed uh, on on an execution unless a prison had to file a claim in order to be reimbursed. I'm not sure if I'm tracking the question to be fair. Well, um, I see what she's saying and yeah, well, just remember everything's inverted. So yeah, if they do have to record a death, invert it in such a way that it comes back so they can collect some insurance money or some kind of scam, you know, it's always going to be a scam. Uh, yeah. I had a great opportunity to meet Max Egan. He does a lot of great videos, the Crow House. Uh, we met at a conference and hung out a bit. Uh, he, he really nails it. Just saying everything's fake here, folks. I'll do my Australian accent here. <laughs> you just got to look at everything the way it really is. 
everything is fake. They're always trying to pull one over on you. Don't believe them. And he's right. <laughs> Australia is going through it now. More of a police state than we are. Poor right. Uh, I've been wow. there and uh, five and a half months in Australia. I love that continent. And the people there, boy, talk about the happy gene. They are some of the funniest, happiest people. So to see them, one of these great Western nations go down this fascist road, it should be cause for alarm for all of us to see what's happening in Australia. Yeah, I would agree with that. I just real quick, uh, Elizabeth on the chat says, bravo, my good man, in terms of your, like what you see motivating you to become more active versus it collapsing, uh, wanting you to collapse. Um, so you got some cheers there. Um, yeah, Australia was bizarro to watch because in my mind, like Australia was originally a, a prison state or a prison right, colony. Yeah. And so it's like, those people are like the hardiest people in my mind. This is like, you know, my American perspective, like they're the hardiest people. They're the ones who aren't going to put up any bull crap because they, they came from like, you know, just, they had to rough it out on their own and became their own country. And so to see them fall within all this oppression in the last two years, and for them to succumb to it was shocking. And I felt like, I felt like that was the the like if Australia goes, and where else can we, you know, start this oppression and, and put all these, uh, always call them rules and regulations in place, um, and confining people and you know forcing people to do this, that, and the other. Like if we can do it to Australia, we can do it anywhere. And it was right. also bizarre to see that happening in Canada because, in, you know, in your mind, in my mind, Canada was like, oh, we love our citizens. We're very, you know, people don't own guns. We, you know, you can walk into someone's house. They don't lock their doors. All this stuff that like connect Canada was so m mellow and bammo, they got it really hard as well. Like <clears throat> it was just bizarro to watch all that. Yeah. Anyway, that's my well, reflection. no, but that should be a, a good wake up call for what they want to do here and exactly. i don't think we're we're over the next pandemic and we're not over lockdowns and we're not over all that stuff <laughs> and maybe they'll they'll unleash a real one next time and yeah you can't put anything past these people they are so devious so dark so controlling and they want their way. But now for the very first time, there's enough pushback that they're feeling pressure. And the timeline that they need to keep is accelerating. Yeah, they have missed yeah. certain markers along the way. They're a bit delayed. So therefore, they're going to push even harder. So the next, not only a couple years, but this decade up till 2030 is so utterly pivotal for the course of the human race. I cannot emphasize it enough. That's why it's all hands on deck right now, you guys. People come up to me at conferences or communicate with me like these indigo children that just can't handle this earth energy anymore. And they're like, I got to check out. I'm out of here. And I say, you can't do that. We need everybody now, if only to hold the space for this golden age if you can only just do that and stay alive long enough to watch us through here and just contribute with your consciousness, then that's enough. Stay on board. We need you. We're the ground crew here. And this is so utterly pivotal We're moment in history. Right. Even the next couple of months are going to be extremely important which way things go. And you'll know it. Everybody's going to know it. They're out in the open now with their plans. And uh, keep on keeping on, everybody. We need you. Well, that's one of the things just and I do want to talk about maybe the Guidestones in 2030, because people don't know what the Georgia Guidestones were. I didn't know what they were until like actually I heard you talking about it with somebody else. And I was like, what the what? So um, but one of the things on the brighter side, perhaps, is that um, I do think that people are popping open. There are people who come in to wake up. And, and they are waking up spontaneously. They're having spontaneous Kundalini events. There are kids coming in who are connected, who are aware of their ET family, who don't lose that connection. Um, shout out Mary Rodwell <laughs> and others who are doing that work. Um, so I think that there are, you know, it's, it's as much light as there is coming in, the darkness always doubles down, but there's still more light coming in. And one of the things that my understanding, Brad, maybe you can speak to this and then we'll talk about the 2030 uh, stuff. Um, is that from the central sun, which is like consciousness, is like pure radiant 
you know, consciousness of all that is, there is a love wave that's coming through the cosmos, that's coming through the universe, it's coming through our galaxy, that is an initial love wave of um, a waking up and that we're in the emanations of it, which is why some people are losing their shizzle and other people are like, hey, I'm gonna keep going. I'm like, I'm awake, I'm alive, I'm in alignment to my path. And I don't know, have you heard anything about that, uh, Mr. Brad? As far as people waking The love up. wave from the central sun. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and it, it's recorded in the Schumann resonance. So there are charts, you can look it up on the internet pretty easily, look up Schumann, S-C-H-U-M-A-N-N. And there are charts that show that there is huge amounts of energy that are coming into the planet. Uh, sometimes so off the chart that these meters can't even register how high they go. So we are being bombarded with uh, cosmic rays. This is the unseen realms that you can't, actually see but you can sometimes feel i know that there's days where it just seems overbearing and things aren't gonna work out and oh my goodness i better go escape to a piece of land and hunker down and then other days where i feel like yeah we got this we're gonna defeat these guys it's gonna be the greatest show in the universe when this all goes down and it's in the process of happening so we're here to witness it right now. And so I've always said, this is the best time in human history to be alive. So you don't want to check out before the end of the show. This is really the culmination of thousands of years of oppression. And we're finally reaching this point. And we are being aided not only by benevolent ETs who prefer to do their work from the back end and not be seen, but also by these cosmic waves and the Schumann resonance that the, uh, is reaching a, a fevered pitch right now. Mm -hmm. I like that. It's, it's good to, to lean back into the light. Um, I do wish I had your, if I could have a genetic infusion of your happy gene, <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, so let's talk about um, then, unless uh, Linda or, or Jason, do I say something before I- um, Well, like Mana thing is gonna tie into the 2030 okay. uh, part because there was another interview uh, Brad, where you were talking about the gas prices and if the gas prices ever went to like four to five dollars, that that very soon after economic collapse, right? Yeah. People can't afford to go to work. Um, and I, I don't want to kind of jump the gun, but, you know, gas prices are now going back, at least here. I mean, they're still expensive, um, but it's not four fifty a gallon. I got gas yesterday. I think it was like three forty seven. Um, like it, it's going wow. down. What's the state uh, of Alabama? Alabama. Alabama? That's where I need to live. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> so at least here, gas prices are, are going down. I think somebody else at another gas station got it for like three eighteen that they had posted. You know, they posted on Facebook because they were so excited. They're like, "I got gas for three dollars and eighteen cents." Um, do you still see that progressing in that manner? Oh, it's going to go back up. You see, we got a midterm election coming up here in just two and a half months. And th there's a lot of politicians that know they have their neck on the line. So whatever they need to do to bring that price down, but it's still way, way more than it was two and a half years ago before right. the Biden show began. Uh, so yeah, okay, it goes down uh, 10%. That's great. I'm about to take a road trip right now. I'll take any help I can get. But the metric is still the same. What they're doing is just delay tactics. If they can push this out until after the election, mark my words, gas prices are going to shoot up. Everything's going way up in November, and it's never going to come back down. And that will absolutely collapse the economy. Already, there are people that can't even afford to go to work and are suffering economically. Uh, what is it now? 40% of all Americans have less than $100 to their name, that they're oh just God. living paycheck to paycheck. So yeah, bring up the gas price another buck or two, and it's just going to grind this country to a halt. Not only that, but there's an additive that goes into diesel fuel. That too is being cut off in short supply. So in order for the aggregate of all these supply chain uh, issues, including food, to really hit all of us, and I've noticed out here in California, 
that they stretch out the products on the shelf. They don't want to leave mm -hmm. empty shelves, but they'll take one product that used to be this big and spread it out that big. But that shows you that there is supply chain shortages in just about everything. In fact, I, I had some work done on my car and I said, yeah, I guess I might as well get this work done. He goes, yeah, you sure better because these parts are going empty and you may not be able to get car parts anymore in the coming months uh, because everything is, it's not coming over from China anymore either. And well, just out here in California, I was just down in Long Beach in June for a conference disclosure fest. We went out to the beach and there's all those hundreds of, or at least dozens of, of uh, container ships waiting to go into Long Beach uh, container port and they're just sitting there. Uh, some are even being sent back, I understand. So it's happening, guys. The supply chains are running out. Like the Boy Scout motto, be prepared. I mean, you, you really can't stock up on this $3.19 gas. You can only hold what's in your tank and maybe a couple extra gallons. But see, that's how they restrict our movement. Yeah. We had the ability to just go anywhere all the time. Uh, then, yeah, we could escape some of the, the madness that is going to come to the cities. Because look, there's an old saying that goes all the way back to the French Revolution that total societal collapse and breakdown, revolution is only eight meals away, right? So that's three days when the supply chain in the food supermarkets and restaurants goes bare, you got three days until utter chaos erupts. That's been known for over 200 years. So the globalists are playing this. Why do you think you could, well, now beef prices are going up, but how is it that you could get a 99 cent cheeseburger and that costs less than an apple? How's that possible? Mm. So they, they, it's all bread and circuses, you guys. Keep giving them cheap entertainment and cheap food, just enough to keep you satiated so you don't revolt. I mean, this is a page right out of the globalist playbook and has been for centuries. So let's talk about then that with the 2030 agenda, um, because I actually work for a health food store. And yes, that's exactly what happens. We run out of product and the upper ups are like, spread this, spread what we have out. So you spread it out over like three. And it's like, no one's fooled by this. Just so you yeah. know, no one's fooled. Um, but, um, you know, because it, it to me, I just kind of want to unpack this agenda because it seems like what they don't want is revolt. So I see the split happening where it's like, okay, so there's going to be those people, especially in America, you have the people who are like, I will grow my own food and I'll have my own gun and I'll, you know, which is no, no judgment. That's kind of like a, a proactive way to be. It can get a little bit extreme perhaps, but um, and then you have people who are like, oh gosh, well, if that happens, who's going to take care of me? So you have the people who are, you know, going to keep wanting the government to believe that the government's going to do something versus realizing that they're the ones who are doing something, not for your benefit. And the ones who are like, I will be sovereign. I will have my own land. And it's like, I will figure out how to do these things on my own. I actually spotted a book called No Grid Survival. So it's like, it's like, how do you live, you know, on the land without anything? And hopefully that's not, I would rather live communally with people. I don't, I'm not, if, if I have to live solo, I'll just die. I'll perish. But, um, but I'm wondering what that looks like for the 2030 agenda and, and how maybe the Georgia Guidestones play into that, if that's connected. Yeah, it sure is. And I'm glad you brought up Georgia Guidestones because here they are. Yeah, they're in Beyond Esoteric. Well, now they're gone. Well, what are they? Okay. What, what, what are they? So they were put up in the early 1990s by an anonymous donor. They were pretty expensive to create by the name of R.C. Christian, which many people believe to be Ted Turner because they're right outside of Georgia, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, where CNN was headquartered. And Ted Turner's a known eugenicist, uh, complains about the overpopulation of the planet. And in fact, the number one guidestone outline, uh, a vague allusion to eugenics, is maintain humanity under 500 million people in perpetual balance with nature. Well, that sounds good. Perpetual balance with nature. Let's make it more of a garden planet. Uh, but what what happens to the other 90% again? Oh, uh, uh, a genocide. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You got to get rid of a lot of people. 
Uh, number two, guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Hmm. Okay, that, that sounds kind of cool. Unite humanity with a living new language. I wonder what that is. Maybe telepathy? No, I don't think they're going on that course. Rule, passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. This is right, reading right out of uh, the Guidestones. Uh, and it goes on, protecting nations, laws and courts, let all nations rule internally, uh, avoid petty laws, useless officials, balance personal rights and social duties, prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. Mm, wow. Nice flower. That, sounds, really that sounds great. All that sounds oh, wait, great. There's one more. And number 10, be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. And they repeat, leave room for nature. So what they're saying is, and you mentioned this agenda 2030, where we're going with all this. And there is such thing called agenda 2030, where they have the wildlands project and they want to get people off of out of the wild lands and start making bigger uh, human exclusion zones where we're not even able to go. And I don't know if you guys know this, but there just about every national park has areas where people are not allowed to go, especially out here in the West where you have these, these big parks, there are places you cannot go. And if they catch you, you'll, you'll get fined, maybe even arrested uh, in, in uh, Grand Canyon. There is a place that is also rumored to have Egyptian ruins and all the temples and mesas are named after uh, Egyptian temples. And uh, so, for example, it's uh, the Osiris Mesa and the Isis Needle and all these Egyptian names in there. I did a trip down the Grand Canyon and I I, I knew where this was. And, and some of my colleagues, David Hatcher Childress and... Uh, Gary David and others who live in Sedona area went down there with some drones. They found a big cave entrance up this canyon that is forbidden to go. So there's reasons why they don't keep people there, but there are other places like uh, Glacier National Park that have huge swashes of areas where people cannot go. And I'll tell you, uh, some of the super soldiers who I've spoken to that work in the uh, secret space program have said the reason why you don't see a lot of cattle mutilations anymore, nor bodies from dead abduction victims is they have these areas in some of these national parks where they just drop corpses, bodies, and leave them to the elements to basically pick through the flesh and then they'll come and collect the bones after a while. This is coming straight from sources I know in the secret space program that have said this. So they, they hide their, uh, their actions in different kind of ways, but they use what should be public lands, public property. And now they want to expand that into this agenda 2030 and make these wild lands uh, much more expansive. A lot of people out here in California that have experienced these terrible wildfires, which by the way, haven't really affected this year, hardly at all. One year ago, there were fires that went from the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountain range up and over the crest of the mountain to the backside. Never happened before in history. It happened last summer, not once, but twice. And the second one went into the Tahoe Basin. Fortunately, no homes burned, but quite a few burn scars that are there. Those were directed energy weapon attacks combined with what they've been spraying in the chemtrail, the geoengineering agenda. I have a chapter on geoengineering and beyond esoteric, all the evidence you want and more to show you they have been spraying us. And uh, the, the great geoengineeringwatch.org, Dale Wigington, I've spoken to him on the phone before. He has said that they've done tests on some of the particles that have been sprinkled. Not only are all the trees dying, if, if you go into the Sierras above the 2,000 foot elevation to about 8,000 foot, you'll see all the trees are distressed. And they did some tests on what they were uh, sending down. And it was a fire accelerant, kind of like sparklers when we were kids. Mm. Yeah, that's what they're spraying on us. So when the fires start, they just burn 
uh, unabated for months. And that's what happened last year. But I'll tell you what, guys, I watch this guys daily. The chemtrails have virtually stopped in California since June. And that might be a sign that things have shifted, that perhaps these geoengineering programs have uh, ceased. And I mean, I, I'm not I'm not putting out hopium here to everybody, <laughs> but it is a sign that uh, at least the fires are not raging in the state. And, and last summer and previous summers, oh, it would go right up to the border of BC, Canada, all the way down to Mexico. Fires up and down the whole Western uh, corridor. And we're not seeing that this year. So there is some signs of hope. You, you just said so much there that could be unpacked. Um, so what is the, why, why, are, why have fires? Why burn all the trees? What's, what's the point of that? Agenda 2030. They want what? to get people out of the wildlands. Oh, you're saying so by they don't burning want everything, it's there. making people li leave so they can then take the land. So, so how do we know that the, who put the, the Georgia guidestones there and, and how do we know that it's not altruistic that they're, they're saying, you know, be good to the earth, be good to each other. How, how do we know that it's a different agenda besides the words, which sound really benevolent? Well, you do the math. How, do, how is it that we're close to 8 billion people yet they say we should live in balance with nature with only 500 million? Is this, does it say math. that? Does it, it say that it 500 million in the, that, yeah. in the, in the Georgia Guidestones? It sure does. Oh, well, there you go. You hold okay. it up. And you That's kind of the linchpin. You can read number one. There it is. That's what it said. Now, somebody went in there and blew them up. <laughs> blew them the stones. Mm -hmm. I thought that was hilarious. And you can see the, the video. This guy with a hoodie on comes running in. They, they were under <laughs> surveillance. And then... He goes running out, and then a few minutes later, kapow, blew up one of the guide stones. And then the very next day, uh, Ebert County, Georgia, came in and, and dismantled and tore them out. I don't think they wanted them there to begin with. Uh, and it turned out it was parkland all this time. So they were maintaining them, even though it was a private donation that paid for the guide stones and the land. Uh, they don't want anything to do with it anymore, and they just tore the damn things out. Good for them. Linda, did you have a question? You're off mute. I just want to make sure. Nope. No, well, not so much a question. There are those that believe that the Guidestones were also like post-World War Guidestones for living a healthy life afterwards. Like if if we had shit hit the fan then yeah. it was like a post oh like here's post how you, guidelines here's how you don't do that again here's how you rebuild your society if you survive the genocide uh yeah <laughs> here's how you can how you can live and it makes allusions to the age of reason and i know people that said oh this is a tragedy they were just trying to give us the guidepost well look if it didn't say uh, keep humanity in 500 million balance with nature i wouldn't have a point of contention here but it does and mm, very dead the numbers just don't <laughs> add up well let's talk then about um one of the great things that you said i really wanted to dive into we got about 15 minutes left with you is you know with the esoteric you, you can become healthier wealthier and wiser and living through charity, compassion, and wisdom. And, you know, again, you're somebody like, you do have that life where I'm, you know, really envious because you've had so much adventure and I crave adventure and I feel like I'm still pulling my head out half the time. Um, so how has, you know, the esoteric has helped you become healthier, wealthier, and wiser? And how can we follow that path? Sure. Well, first of all, being healthy, we're being inundated with poisons in so many different directions from fluoride in the water to the geoengineering crap including nanobots that are now getting into the skin and creating all these weird diseases like morgellon syndrome you're getting uh poison through gmos and the food we eat and poison soils so really this is a self-defense posture that we need to take meaning 
you better self-preserve and know what's coming at you and start to detox. In fact, now I say that detox is now a lifelong pursuit. It'll never end. There's so much junk that's being introduced into our bodies that it's going to take <laughs> the entire lifetime to feel good about it. I've just finished another uh, seven-day detox, uh, cleaning out the colon and the intestines and the stomach. You would not be surprised what comes out. It's gross. It's terrible. And it's living inside you, right? And so now with all the the, the nanotechnology and so many other uh, poisons that are being introduced, we have diseases that never existed 20 years ago that are now popping up. And sudden adult death syndrome? Hmm, gosh, what has happened in the last three years to people that could create sudden adult death syndrome? Hmm, it wouldn't have been like that third booster or something. No, 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 that's impossible. It must be climate change. You see how conditioned people are to believe what they're told by government and media and education has sold us down the river. So you have to know these things, what is being affected to you, and you're not being told the truth about it to make yourself healthier. How does wealth and wisdom come into it? Well, uh, a very knowledgeable person, one uh, asked me as a young man, I asked him, what is it that each of us can do on an individual basis to start striving towards enlightenment? And he said, have compassion for everyone and everything, have charitable notions, be in service to all, and be wise. And that is one nice thing about getting old. You have a lifetime to draw upon and a lifetime of learning to also reflect upon. And so use them wisely. We are all on a path in different paths. Some want to achieve enlightenment. Some don't even know what that word means. But everybody has free will to make their choices in this life. And those who want to know more can learn more, but they have to want it. You have to earn that black belt in karate. You can't just be given it. This is your choice to endeavor into these subjects if you feel the calling. But I'm telling you, you should because it's going to affect your life if you don't. So the more you know, knowledge truly is power. The more you know, the better your life is going to be. And it will also help you in your financial state knowing what a scam the Federal Reserve is and what real wealth is. Now, these fiat currencies are currencies. They are not money. You know what money is? Gold and silver. You know what real assets are? Owning your own property. And that is becoming increasingly harder to do. So to just understand this dilemma, and it's even called the earth dilemma, to really find your position in this world today to live a happy and healthy and wealthy life is your prerogative and yours only. So do yourself a favor and start educating yourself on what is really the root cause of all the suffering in the world. This is the quest the Buddha was on. His whole notion leading up to his enlightenment was to understand the suffering of the world. And that's what led him to his enlightenment moment under the Bodhi tree in uh, India. So th this is a quest we can all take. Look, Buddhism is a philosophy. It's not a religion. It was turned into a religion against his own wishes. He said, don't ever immoralize me. It's not about me. It's never about me, the person. We can only be the messengers who is giving this information to others. It's you who have to do the work and figure it out for yourself. That's the great awakening that we find ourselves in. So on that note of the great awakening, you've talked about the event before. And I and so like I have an understanding about the event. My my beliefs and understandings change all, guest per guest. There's always some more information that comes in. But would you describe to us what you see as the event and why is that important? Well, for a long time, the event was going to be this disclosure moment when the ships come down, uh, land on the White House lawn and 
oh, all of a sudden these extraterrestrials from far away are coming here to save the earth. Well, look, that ain't going to happen that way. It just won't. Disclosure is from the ground up. Disclosure is all of us starting to grok this idea that there's a lot of intelligent life out there. And they're looking down on us. This is like the planet of the apes down here. We can't even <laughs> feed a quarter of the Earth population. How many people fall through the cracks every single day? It, it is not because there isn't enough food. It's always a distribution issue. And that can be manipulated. So the Great Awakening is, is, is this light bulb moment, is the hundredth monkey effect, which was a real study that was done in Japan about 50 years ago. And it was watching these different tribes of monkeys and and how, how they would react. So they started throwing them out some uh, some potatoes and they would just be hungry and eat them right away with the dirt and sand on them. And then it was a, a young adolescent female that decided, hey, I'm going to wash this potato off before I'm tempted to eat it and then ate it and realized, wow, this tastes pretty darn good. And sure enough, her other family members started washing their potato first. But the hundredth monkey effect was almost instantaneously, not only the rest of the monkeys on the island started doing that, but other islands that were unaware of the others also started doing it instantaneously. So that's the hundredth monkey effect that could very well happen to the human race, where all of a sudden we just get it. And that would be the great awakening in my view. And, and that would also be the event that we've heard about. And I don't know if it's going to happen like in one instant flash or perhaps prolonged over a period of time, but that is what I really see happening. And once we start getting our act together down here as the human race and start cleaning up Fukushima, for example, which is still bleeding out radiation into the Pacific basin, can't even eat fish in California anymore. They have radiation, all the big uh, apex predators like tuna, which do laps around the Pacific basin. They have radiation in them now. So we have done so many things to poison this planet. And so it's cleaning up the world. It's having this hundredth monkey effect awakening. And then, and only then, do I think we'll have the wherewithal to sit at a table with some of the benevolent ETs that do want to see us succeed, that are helping us in other ways that we just don't understand really right now at this moment. Yeah, I think that's really well said. I like that. I like the idea of the hundredth monkey, the the, the millionth human, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where yeah. we start to pop open. Um, any final questions from Jason or Ms. Linda? I do have a question. So if we make it past this 2030, right? You keep talking about the golden age. Yeah. Um, is that kind of our time frame? Like, hey, let's make it through these next, what years is 2022? Let's make eight it past years. These eight years. <laughs> eight years to go. And then after that, clear sailing or gradually getting better? I, I would say it would be, become very clear which timeline we're on by 2030. And if we're able to prevent World War III, prevent the whole planet from being destroyed, prevent this wholesale genocide of the human race, then we will know we're on to the golden age by the year 2030? That's a great question. Okay. Oh, that's so good. Okay, well with that, Mr. Brad, would you tell us what was the, what would you like to share from your heart to ours, your final closing thoughts, inspiration, words, advice from your heart to our audience? Just to remind people that we're all in this and every one of us matters. Absolutely, no matter what, you have a role to play. You have incarnated here on earth for this mission. That's why it can seem very foreign because some of us have come from other places to help and assist in this moment. In Buddhism, they're called bodhisattvas, those who have already achieved enlightenment but have come back to help the human race. And when you consider how many people are alive in the world today, every historical figure throughout our time is alive in a new human body right now for ill or good. 
they're all here. And so sides are being taken. The line has been drawn. We've actually crossed the Rubicon. So we are in this new age and every one of us has a role to play. As I said earlier, if it's only just holding the space for the golden age in your mind, that helps. And stay in the game. Don't check out, at least not by your own means. You can't do that. You will be reincarnated under much less favorable circumstances than you have now. And let me tell you, I have seen starving and dying people on the streets of India and other very poor countries. You do not want that fate. Because look, if you look at life, it clings to life. Every tree in a craggy rock up against the wind, it survives. It stays on. It is life that wants to live. And so do we. Mm. And we are here to usher in the golden age. So every one of us matters. Every one of our thoughts is very important because our thoughts become our actions, become our legacy. You want to be in this with the winning team is what I'm trying to say. And every one of us plays a role and this is the greatest time to be alive. So you're going to want to see how this all goes down. And I guarantee you there we'll all meet again someday at the big dance in the sky. And I'll hold my hand out for a dance with each one of you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do this and we're going to succeed. And, and this is for all future generations this is for the sovereignty of the human race, and this is for planet Earth itself. So the stakes could not be any higher. That's beautiful. Thank you. And I want to piggyback. I think it was Dr. Brian Weiss, um, who's a hypnotherapist, and he talked about people who would, you know, when they looked at future lives, if they made certain decisions, they actually did end up in a world that was a lot more dark and oppressive. And my personal theory is I've killed myself in so many lifetimes. That's how I got here. Um, so yeah, even though you want to check out, don't check out. Just That's where the moment is. Living in the moment where you can find the um, presence, the love, the possibility in this moment. There's no past. There's no future. Keep coming back to the moment. And that is a very big practice for the monkey mind of which uh, mine's very, very active. So um, with that, I'm going to put us into um, speaker or gallery view, aka Brady Bunch style. And um, I'm going to say thank you, Brad, so very much. And uh, it's been an absolute thrill to have you on the show. And I'll toss the mic over to Linda and we'll start our gratitudes. We've had great discussion in the live stream. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions. And make sure that if you haven't hit that like button, um, hit that, please, and share our podcasts with your friends. Um, and to learn more, if this is all new to you about Brad, make sure you go down to the description box and you can find out his um, podcasts, his books, everything, his next event that's happening in California. That looks kind of fun. Um, kind of like the burning man in town. <laughs> so make sure you check out those links. And I want to thank you, Jason, for coming. And, and thank you, Brad, for being here as our guest. Oh, thank you for having me. It's really been a pleasure talking to you all. And uh, boy, that two hours went by pretty quick. So, you know, it's a good interview and a good conversation <laughs> when that happened. Well, maybe we'll have to have you back on again, eh? Oh, I'd love to. Yay! Okay, good. All right. So thank you so much. Um, at, normally, this is the time when I tell you who our guest is next week, but we had a little schedule whoopsie-woo, so we have an open spot next week. I'll be working on that tomorrow to get that filled that I don't have anyone to tell you for right now for next week, but we'll find out. Um, all right. And with that, uh, thank you again, everybody, um, for participating, for being here with us, for being part of our community. Um, be also oh kind to yourself, be kind to others, and keep living from your heart. We love you, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye.